Some of you may have heard the story. I heard it for the first time this week. It's a story about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. They decide to go camping. And they go and they set, set the camp all up and they put the campfire and they have a campfire dinner and they sit and talk and they go to bed. And some hours later, Holmes is awoken by being nudged and Watson and him were awake, and Holmes says to him, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. And Watson pondered for a moment. He said, astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies, potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Just looking at time, I deduce that it's approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. I suspect that the weather will be beautiful tomorrow from what I see. What does it tell you, Holmes? And Holmes was silent for a minute, and then he spoke. Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> there are times we can be so focused on something we miss the obvious. And we have all done that. We've been looking for our glasses and they've been on top of our head or even in our hand and we're looking for the keys to the car and they're sitting in the ignition. We can get so focused on something we miss a bigger thing. And this is true of this passage I want to talk to you about this morning. I think many things have been pulled out of this passage and we have focused on it. We've missed what God is trying to communicate to us. If you'll turn with me to the book of James chapter 5. Book of James chapter 5. We're going to look at three questions and uh, three responses. And in James chapter 5, starting at verse 13, James says this, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain and produced the earth. I'm sorry, the earth produced its fruit. The reason I'm sharing this is, you know, we've done a lot as a church. I've done a lot as a pastor. And, and when Beth got sick, um, we had a lot of people calling us uh, wanting to know why she did not come forward. And um, unfortunately, my wife even got to the point, she said, let's just do it and get them off of our backs. Now, she wasn't being mean and abrasive about that. What she was saying is, I just want this to stop. So was she going to do that out of faith or obligation? And, and God says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And I knew that would not please God. And so I said, honey, we're not going to do that. And I said, honey, there's a lot of people that feel the same way you do. And I had some people uh, call me. I had um, somebody come by the office. Uh, I had about four phone calls. And I said, you know, I need to figure out um, what does God say and really study it. And I don't know if you've done this. As you get older, you become what? Wiser. Um, you don't have your focus on one thing. You're trying to see bigger pictures. And I want to share with you what, what God's shown me through His Word because I believe we get so focused on one thing, we're missing a much bigger picture. Um, it starts off with this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Some, some of your Bibles has sing praises. And what James is doing right there in verse 13 is giving us extremes. Suffering on this end and joy on this end. If you're cheerful, you're to do what? Sing. To sing. If you're suffering, you're to do what? Pray. And it's very interesting. He says, if anyone, who's to do the praying and who's to do the singing? The person who's cheerful is to sing and the person who's suffering is to sing. And so the very first response we see to these questions reveals our response to life because suffering should cause us to communicate with God. Joys and happiness should cause us to communicate with God. So in everything we're to bring it to 
God. It's real simple is what James is saying here. Suffering, this word suffering is interesting. When you study the book of James, it's being written to Christians that are really struggling and being persecuted. And so some people translate that and say, well, that's because they're being persecuted and it's talking about that. But the Greek word for this suffering is a really powerful word. It means suffering. And it's, it is a general term. It can mean a mother who is a new mother and has been overburdened with this new responsibility and the baby won't stop crying and I can't get this to stop and she is just overwhelmed to the point of tears. How many of y'all ever felt that way raising your children? Just overwhelmed. That's suffering. And God says if you're suffering you need to what? Pray. Pray. It could be a teenager that doesn't want to go to school, uh, whether they hate school or hate their peers and what their peers are doing at school, and they're suffering. It could be a, a man that is, he can't pay the bills, he's working as hard as he can, he just can't get out of the hole, it's just one thing after another. It could be sickness, it could be anything. If you're suffering, we're to communicate with God and pray. And if life is good and things are going great, we're to communicate to God, and not just praise Him and thank Him, but to sing to him. He, and, and what James is saying is in all things we should be coming to God. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7 it says this, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. It says in everything. And when we do that it's, God gives us promise. And the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 6.18 it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I don't know how they did this study, but they said the average Christian prays two to three minutes a day. Now you may say, I'll do more than that. This is just the average Christian. Two to three minutes a day. They did another study. The average American complains over eight minutes a day. And I wonder if we asked ourselves and just asked this question, if I were to take a stopwatch in this hand and this hand and every time I prayed throughout the day I hit it and then stopped and every time I complained or vented I hit it or stopped, which stopwatch would be have the most time on it? And it could be maybe the problem with our problem is we're complaining and we're not praying. If you're complaining about somebody or venting about somebody or or really having a heart, that should be a red flag that I need to stop and what? Pray. And God says, in the peace of God which surpasses understanding will fill your, listen, your hearts and your, your minds. There are many things God will not do apart from His children's prayers. Let me say that again. There are many things God will not do apart from His children's prayers. And, and God's not playing a game with us. This is about relationship and being relational. He says, you have not because you ask not. And so in our suffering and in our joys, whatever it is, we need to be praying. Mia came home yesterday. Pray for my grandchild. She's going to be so spoil rotten. My gave her. She goes, to a, she goes to a birthday party and she gets a gift. So she comes home and she's got this gift and she's trying to open it. And I don't know if you noticed toys today. You need a chainsaw and a toolbox to get the toys out. They're wired in and screwed in and everything else. And she's very strong. She said, I've got this, i got this. I said, okay. And finally she realized she doesn't have this. And she says, Aggie, help me. And she came and she said, Aggie, help me. And she gave it to me. Now she gave it to me because so far my track record is 100%. I can fix broken crayons. I can fix broken toys. I can put hair back on a doll. I'm doing really well, Robin. <laughs> the truth will come out. She will find out one day I'm not as good as she thinks I am. But she came to me just not even like, can you help me? She was like, Augie, help me. She knew it's going to get what? It's going to get fixed. It's going to get done. And I sat there and she watched me do the operation and cut with the scissors and unscrew this and break that. And it took me a while to get it, but that baby was set free. And you know what she did after the baby was set free? She left me. <laughs> not a thank you, not a anything. Um... You know, she didn't even hug me. And that's okay because she was excited about the gift. Sometimes if we're not careful when we're praying, we forget two things. We don't have to struggle 
we can just start right out by asking God. Pray first. If she had just come to me right away, she'd have gotten the toy a lot faster. The second thing is, when we do receive a good gift, we need to thank the gift giver. But sometimes we get so caught up in the gift that we forget all about him. James' first point in the prayer life of a church is no matter what's going on, we need to pray. Jesus said, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What God is revealing through this letter is prayer should be our priority. And, and I'm going to give you a definition of prayer that's really simple. It is an honest, intimate communication. That's it. You can remember that. Prayer is just an honest, intimate communication. I think so much of what we have been taught by prayer has really twisted the way we think. And he's about to enter into a new verse, and this will be our second point. And I think because of the stuff we see in here, we have gotten some distorted views on what prayer is. Prayer is honest, intimate communication. That's it. So if I'm struggling with somebody at work and I'm angry about it, I, don't, I shouldn't pray this way. Is this being honest? Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength at the moment. I praise you for who you are. You are great and mighty. Please heal them. Is that honest, intimate prayer? This is how your pastor prays. Lord, these feelings of anger and hatred have come back, and I hate that I even feel this way. And so, Father, I'm praying that you would heal my heart first because I want to punch this man in the throat. <laughs> and that is murderous anger which you condemn. So, Father, forgive me. Father, I need to see the situation from your eyes and I need your wisdom. Remind me this person is valuable to you and you died for him. God, forgive me again. And, and you know what starts to happen in my heart, in my mind? The peace of God. And for a moment, I see my sin for what it really is. Is it pretty or ugly, Ermel? It is ugly. And I see it, but I'm resting in the love that God has for me, that he's forgiven me of that. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And I'm going to finish this good work in you, Larry. And one day, these feelings you have are going to be completely wiped out. And I rejoice and I sing praise to him. And then I pray for the person that's caused my thorn in the flesh. I pray for them. And that begins to create a new love for them. The love that God has for them, I now begin to have that love for them. Prayer changes things if we're honest and if we're intimate. There's a story of a young boy that wanted a bike. He asked Santa for a bike. He didn't get a bike. So somebody said, you need to pray to God for a bike. He said, you're right. I'll override Santa. <laughs> but he didn't know anything about prayer. So what he did is he went on TV, the best place you can learn about how to pray. So he goes on TV, and the first show he saw, the people said, when you address God, you need to have a form of reverence and awe, and you need to use the king's language, and then God will hear you. So he listened to this man pray, so he went to his room, and this is what he said. Almighty, great creator, the God of all things. You have bestoweth upon man the gift of prayer. And I come to you, benevolent Father, requesting that you would endow me with a bike that I may glorify your kingdom. <laughs> Let it be so. Amen. And he got up and there was no bike. So he threw that out. So he went and watched another show. And he watched that show and he came back. He said, I was praying all wrong. This guy has got it. So he comes back, God, I'm your child. You don't want your child unhappy. You want me to have what I claim. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I claim a bike. And I'm praying specifically for a blue one with red stripes and the banana seat. In God's name, I pray this, that Jesus would grant an amen. And he got up. And guess what? No bikes. So he went to watch TV again. And he listened to another preacher. And he said, I didn't claim the promises. So he goes back. He says, whatever we ask, you shall give us. And you said, if we are in need, you would be there. 
And so, Father, in the promises that you've granted, I am asking you in obedience to your word to grant me this bike. I claim it in the name of Jesus Christ. It is meeting a need I have. You will meet all of our needs. Praise Jesus for the answer prayer because I believe it and I claimed it. And no bike. So he goes into his mother's room. He grabs the statue of Mary. He goes into the woods. And he comes back. And he prays this. I have kidnapped your mother. You'll get her back when I get the bike. <laughs> now we laugh at that. But there is a lot of truth in that joke. Everybody has their own view of how you're supposed to what? And every view is right. But what does God say? And I think what has happened, church, is we've heard so many things from so many different people. And we haven't gone to God's word and says, how does God tell us to do this? It's in here. This verse I'm about to share with you has been twisted by a lot of different people that teach prayer a lot of different ways. I'm going to do the best that I can as your pastor to break this down. All I'm asking you is just to listen with open hearts and open minds and to think about what I'm about to say. Okay? Verse 14. This is revealing our response in times of great weakness. Verse 14 says another question. Is anyone among you what? Sick. That word sick means debilitating weakness. And it can mean physical, mental, emotional. It is a totally debilitating weakness. Some of us have been there. I remember when my back went out and a nerve that had bone in it and how bad that pain was. And all I could do was lay. That's debilitating physical weakness. Some of you know this feeling too that things are so bad and so overwhelming and so heavy that even in your soul, it is hard for you to read God's word and to pray. Have any of you ever been in that place? Just hard? Raise it again so I can see. Some of you are honest. There he is. Just, ah, oh, you can't do it. It's talking about this debilitating weakness. Some of us have just been through whether a divorce or a lawsuit or something, and emotionally you are just exhausted it means very, very weak, a place one, not, one cannot pray for themselves. And so is any one of you sick is referring to this great debilitating weakness. And listen to what it says. It says, let him call for the elders of the church. Now, who are the elders of the church? It's the pastor. The Bible uses the word pastor, bishop, elder. It's all the same person. Let the elders. Now, it doesn't say elder, does it? Elders, and in churches there was this plurality of elders, but let me tell you what they also did back in the early church, which I think is wonderful, and we need to get back to it. You'd have a number of different elders in a community, just like we do, and those elders would work together. We're on the same team. And so some people think it's talking about the elders of the churches coming to pray for those in that condition. So you'd have the pastor of Ephesus and Grace and Beale and Mount Zion and all. Wouldn't that be glorious? Coming to a home and praying together. Some churches had a, a plurality of elders, and that's something we've been praying about and working about because we want to be uh, in line with God's Word. But you'd have the leadership of the church come. And this isn't talking about, and this, I want you to be open to this because I used to preach this. And after studying it, I have to just confess I was wrong. This isn't a prayer service. This isn't bringing them up front and laying hands and doing all that like a prayer service. This is somebody that is in such a bad place they can't get here. Or they can't pray to God. Or they can't, they're just debilitated. And so the elders actually go to what? Them. And we've done that in this church numerous times. Gone to people's homes and prayed for them and laid hands on them. That's what this is talking about. It's kind of implied in how it's written. Look at it. Let them pray what? Over them. In the Greek it's, it has this picture of them actually over a person and, and praying for them. And it says anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And he who has committed sins will be forgiven. This verse sadly has been abused violently two ways. Number one, it's been ignored. 
That's a great abuse. God has given us instruction how to do this. When somebody gets in this condition, what are we to do? We're to call for the elders and they're to come and what? Pray. And so there's some that have abused it this way and say, that was for then, not for now. Listen, God is an extraordinary God and God is a powerful God. And God has given instruction to the church how to pray for one another. And we abuse it when we say, well, this doesn't apply. We've, I, can't, I wish I could tell you story after story after story of when we have done this and gone to somebody's home and things that have happened. I leave there amazed. And let me tell you who gets the glory. It's not Pastor Larry. It's God. And I believe the reason you have the elders and not one is because God does things in groups. I don't know if you've noticed that as you study God's Word. There's no lone rangers. So it says don't call. It doesn't say call for the healer, does it? Does it say call for the guy to lay, put a hand on your forehead? Is that what it calls for? It says the elders. Because if all of them lay hands and pray, who gets the glory? Listen, if I go and pray and someone's healed, you know what people tend to say? Larry's got the connection. Larry's closer to God than I am. But if you have a group, you can't do that, can you? I think that's why God has us here. Because we're, we're fallen men. We kind of gravitate that way. The other way this has been abused, and it's been a terrible abuse, and many of us have suffered it, and I've talked to many people that have been hurt by this, is some people, false teachers falsely teach that any kind of sickness is not of God. It's a sign of a lack of faith in the person that's sick, or in the prayer itself, or even the elders. That God wants everybody what? Well. Since Genesis, we have seen something. When Adam sinned, death and decay and sickness and thorns have been in the world. And the Bible has a lot to say about sickness. A lot. The number one sickness that we're all dying from, your pastor included, is what the Bible calls a sickness unto death. The wages of sin is what, Pam? Let me share something with you. Every time you're sinning, you're bringing death into your life. The reason we get old and our joints hurt and our knees ache and our backs go out is we, whether we want to say it or not, we are dying. And the wages of sin has brought death into this world. The reason animals die is because man has brought sin into this world. The reason the universe is dying is because man brought sin into this world. Ezekiel says, the soul that sins shall die. So that's the first type of death. I mean, sickness we have. We all get sick because sadly we're all decaying. There's a sickness as a consequence to bad choices or sinful behavior. I thought of J.D. Stamper. Incredible pain. Incredible hurt in his body. And it's a consequence of someone's bad choices. Some of us, no offense, drink like a fish. Y'all can drink some people under a table. And as you get older and you find out you have cirrhosis of the liver or throat cancer, and the doctor looks at you and says, this is a consequence of your sinful behavior. Many of y'all are smokers. Some of y'all are dippers. Some of you are chewers. But if I smoke, Barbara, I'll pick on you because I love you. I can do that, but there's consequences for that. And some suffer faster than others. Have you noticed that? They got a man that's over 100 years old, smokes a cigar every day. He doesn't have a lick of cancer in his body. You have another person that's in their 40s that has lung cancer in both lungs. They've been smoking since they were a teenager. There's sickness from the consequence of our sins. There's sickness, here's one, from spiritual attack. We get that in Luke 13. Jesus was healing a woman with a spirit of infirmity that caused her back to be deformed and to bend. There's a, the spiritual attack sickness can even come from sins that we do but can be done because of church discipline Paul says, deliver one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of Jesus. And, and the last one is one we don't talk about because we have a hard time with it. There's a sickness for the glory of God. There's a sickness that is given. 
to glorify God and the sickness that's given for his purposes. The disciples were asking about a sick man and said, whose who sins cause this sickness? His parents or him? And this is Jesus' answer. The sickness does not, is not unto death. That's the sickness unto death. But for the glory of God, that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. And so when somebody gets sick, church, the first thing we really shouldn't do is try to guess why they're sick. Why does Beth get cancer? Is it sin in her life? Could be. You don't know her. I live with her. <laughs> no, it could be. Could it be from bad choices? Could be. Could it be a spiritual attack? Could be. Could it be for the glory of God? Could be. Now let me ask you this question, church. Do y'all know what it is? And neither do I. And it's presumptuous if you think you do. The only one that really knows is who? God. And so what James is teaching is, if you're suffering or you're going through anything, the first place we should go to is who? God. But if you can't do it, if you're such at a place where you're either angry at God or debilitated or physically sick and you can't, then you call for the elders and they come and pray to God on your <coughs> behalf. And as we pray, does God promise He's going to heal everybody? No. And if He doesn't heal anybody, does it show a lack of faith? No. Let me show you a person who I think is a great man of faith. Let me read you his testimony. And you'll know, many of you will know who he is as soon as I begin to read. Lest I should have been exalted beyond measure by the abundance of revelations given to me, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Listen to this, a messenger of Satan. So where did this, this infirmity come from? This is a spiritual one from Satan. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. And concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it may depart from me. And he said to me, rise up and you are healed. Your faith has made you well. Yeah, thank you, Danielle. Danielle did this. It says this. This is God's answer. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so the Apostle Paul said, therefore, I most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and the reproaches and the needs and the persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let me ask you a question, church. Who allowed that infirmity to come upon Paul? God. And what was the purpose of that infirmity? That Christ may be glorified. There are times that God will heal somebody, and that is done for the glory of who? And there are times people get sick and stay sick, and even that too should be for the glory of God. And there are sometimes people will die. And that, too, is for the glory of God. When he says, let them call for the elders, God is asking that those who have been placed over you will help you burden that and take your request to God because you can't. And when it says, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord, the point is not even the elders, and the point is not even the oil. That oil is a... And every scholar pretty much agrees with this. It was a common day rubbing oil. It was a medicinal oil. It was a, for refreshing and for healing and medicinal purposes. And so what it's saying is the elders are to go to that person. Listen, this is lessons for all of us. And meet their physical needs as well as their spiritual needs. What we've done is we've made the elders a special class, if you will, and only healing can come through them. Or if you have the oil, if you don't use the oil, healing won't come. That's not the whole point of the, the bigger picture. It's not the tent. The bigger picture is this. We're to meet the physical needs and the spiritual needs. There's no, I'm going to say this, it's going to make some of you mad, but I want you to hear me. The power is not in the oil. And the power is not on the elder's hand. The power is from who? God. 
He's saying, when you pray for them, elders, anoint them with oil. Meet their physical and their spiritual needs. And those praying over them, anoint them in the name of the Lord. I saw a guy on TV do this the other day. We're going to put oil on them. And they did a cross. They don't know they got that from the Catholic Church. But they put the cross. And then they put their hand on them. And they said this, Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's not in that name either. When it says praying in Jesus' name, it means praying as Jesus would how Jesus would, praying in his name on the behalf and representing, listen, this is scary, Jesus. So when I go to pray for somebody, I don't know what this sickness really is about, but who does? And I don't know why they're so defeated, but God does. He's asked me to come minister to them spiritually and physically. And listen, I don't have a problem putting mineral oil on you or fragrant oil. Or oil from the Jordan, wherever you get it. But the power is not in the oil. It's not in my hand. And it's not just saying the name. It's praying according to God's word and according to God's will. God, I don't know what's going on here. You do. We're praying for healing. We're praying for restoration. We're praying most importantly above all things that you will be what? Glorified. And we're praying this just the way Jesus prayed. And then it says this, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. I don't have my phone and y'all are in trouble. I'm sensing we're running over. All right. It says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. That word save means physically restore. And the prayer of faith is not the faith of the one on the bed. It's the one of the elders. And that restoring is, is something that who does? God does. When it says the prayer of faith, many false teachers have, have done a cruel trick to us and said that means the confidence in which you believe. So when it says prayer and faith, if I have enough confidence and I believe hard enough, it'll happen. So really that's all on who? That's not a prayer of faith. A prayer of faith is a prayer that's entrusting oneself to God's will and to God's word. It says this, now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have it. And then it says, if we pray that prayer of faith, the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, if this is a sickness unto, because of sins, if sins have been committed, he will be forgiven. The Lord is the one who heals and restores. And then what it does, it says this. This is really interesting. I'm going to skip some things, but it's real interesting. Verse 16 says, Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. And the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. James is using an illustration to make a point, and he's using Elijah. I've never seen this in my entire ministry. God showed it to me this week, and when I say God showed it to me, it wasn't like an aha moment. It was just in studying his word. The thing that Elijah prayed for comes right out of the word of God. I always thought this, Ermel. Elijah said, I look at all the bad that's going on. I'll pray it'll stop raining, and that'll teach them. And I'm not going to pray for the rain to come back until they repent. But that's not what happens. God tells Elijah, and Elijah knows this ahead of time. But in Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 11, God says, when they go after idols and chase idols, I will stop the rain. Elijah was a man of God's word, and he's praying the way Christ would, according to God's will and according to God's word. And so Elijah begins to pray. May the rain stop, because your word has said, when a nation turns to the idols, you will stop the rain. His burden was for the nation to be healed. And he knew what God said. So he's praying God's what? Word. And that's how we're to pray. The way we're to pray as a church, you really want to know what a church prayer meeting would look like? I've never seen one. It's where we get together. I'll get with you, Camden. And we'll get in a little group maybe. You do this with some men that you have, a little group you have. And we confess our sins to one another. 
Don't do that with a gossip, by the way. So I come to you, Pam, and say, Pam, I need you to pray for me. I have been having some murderous thoughts at work. I want to punch this guy in the throat. I know that is in the flesh. Um, I'm going to confess this to you. I've slandered him. And I've tried to hurt him because he's hurt me. And I have sinned against God. Can you pray for me? And Pam comes over and says, let's pray, Larry. Lord, Larry's struggling with this. He's walking in the flesh. He knows he's doing wrong. Can you fill him so he'll be controlled by your spirit? Will you help him to love him? Will you help him to overcome this sin? And then after you pray, you say, Larry, can I confess something to you? Yeah. I killed Bill last night. <laughs> in my mind. Are you struggling with that too? Yes. Let me pray for you, Pam. And we're praying for each other, not just confessing our sins, but we're praying for one another. A lot of the hurt and harm and sickness in our life is because there's unconfessed sin in our life. There is something the Catholics do that I envy. No matter what you've done, you can go to a little box and sit there and confess your sins. And we're supposed to confess our sins to God, but look what he says the church is to do here. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. And then he gives this illustration of a man who was effective, fervent prayer because he prayed God's word. He prayed the will of God. And God answered his prayer. Not because he wanted it, but because it was, was God's will. If I were to ask y'all, how many of y'all know we need to pray more? Raise your hand. See, we all know this. If I said, how many of you really like to be somebody that, that prays every day? Raise your hand. More than three minutes a day. Oh, the hands went down. That was amazing. The average is right. Um, we all know that we want to. Why is it we don't pray more? In church, I am not opposed to a prayer meeting. I am really not. But God is calling us to something higher than that. He's calling us to labor with one another daily, praying first for yourself. And if you're too weak to pray for yourself, you call your pastors and they will come pray with you. But we're to pray for what? One another. The reason I'm sharing this with church is because I love you. And, and I, I know there's people like John Hardy and my wife. And there's others that don't want to come up here and be prayed for. But guess what they really want? They want prayer. So these are two things I want you to walk away with. Here's your, here's your action plans to do today. And I need, I need two ushers, Jim, and I need another usher. Who ushered today? Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you or make you do anything you don't want to do. I just need you to hand some things out, and then they rise and come. All right. Y'all have been patiently waiting for these. <clears throat> and you need to thank Tammy for the work. She did all of it, and she wrestled with the company, and she fought with the company. I would give one to whoever wants one if they're going to pray. I'm stick my lip out there. Um, these are for the members. I'd like the members to have them first, but I think we have enough. The first thing we need to do, church, is really hard and really simple all at the same time. It's to get in the habit of praying without ceasing. And if we would pray without ceasing, and that means just pray as we go throughout our day, you would be amazed at what God will not only do for you, but do through you. I do that when I'm at Walmart. And I'm not talking about this kind of prayer. God, please don't let me get caught by anybody. Please don't let me get caught by anybody. Please, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about as I'm walking through praying for people and I'm, as I'm at the register praying for her, as I'm going in the parking lot praying for the family with the children and praying you will receive the peace of God which surpasses understanding and will fill your heart and your mind. When you're at work, praying. When people are agitating you, praying. It's called praying without ceasing. It's talking to God throughout the whole day. We need to get in the habit of that. The second thing that we need to do, and God has been teaching me this, and I have prayer is probably the weakest part of my spiritual life. Not because I don't want to, because I'm just like you. I want to pray more. I want to do this. 
but I don't plan on praying. Something has changed within the last two months of my life, and it's really simple. I've just got a plan. And I've been working the plan. And let me share something with you, church. I have been shocked at what I've seen God do. Shocked to the point that I am embarrassed that I hadn't been doing this longer. On Mondays, third, Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Friday, I pray for my family. I have a little routine I do at the same time in the same place. I pray for them, and I'm working through a book. This has been so effective. I've been listening to some other people, and they've been helping me get a plan. So on Saturdays, I pray for the worship service. On Sundays, I pray for my week. On Monday, first Monday of the month, I will be praying for something specific. The second Monday, something specific, and so on. I want to keep that private. I'm praying for y'all through this book in my prayer book. And that's why sometimes you'll get this. Is there anything I can pray for you for? And I'll ask you. What God would want more than a prayer meeting. Am I against a prayer meeting? No. If you want to be anointed with oil, will I anoint you? Yes, but I want you to know it's not the oil, it's not the hands, it's, it's who? It's God. But let me tell you what he wants us to do. He wants us to labor through this book. And so if I ask Dennis and Janet, would y'all like me to pray for you every week? Yeah, raise your hand if you want your pastor praying for you every week. Every day. Every day. Look at that. I'm going to work through this every week. Praying for y'all. Now, some of y'all just did this. I'm not in here. I've got a folder at home called, and I stole this from the Catholics, I did, called the Rosary. And there's pictures of many of y'all in that, and I flip through the pictures and pray for you. The children and the parents that came to Easter, I pray for them. The kids that I'm teaching, I'm praying for them. But most importantly, we all should be praying for ourselves every day. And so what I'm challenging you to do today, church, is to make a plan to pray for your church family. We're going to pray for, where's Randall? Come here, Randy. This young man sent me a text last night. He said, can you pray for me? I have surgery on Tuesday. And so we're going to pray for his, his surgery. But let me share something with you, church. And I'm not saying this to chasten us, I'm challenging us. I can put my hand on him and pray. And that's special, amen? And there's something that happens in the service when somebody does that. But you know it'd be more special if the 195 people that are tied to this church would pray for him today, tomorrow, and Tuesday morning and pray for his family. And what would really be special is if he's praying for himself. And so we're going to pray for him. I'm going to have Glenn come forward. Uh, where's my men that I'm meeting with on Monday mornings? I mean Monday, Sunday mornings. Tyler, John. In church, we're going to pray for him, and then we're going to dismiss and this is how we're going to dismiss. I'm going to let Pam play. We're going to spend a little time in prayer uh, to God and asking him to help us to labor in prayer for our church family, for your pastor, for the secretary, for Michelle and the school and the teachers. And in the months to come, we're going to be giving you tools to help you pray. If you're willing to begin, I'm not committing you to anything, but if you're willing to intentionally begin to figure out how can I plan to pray and labor to pray for our church family. Would you stand as well? Right where you are. Just be honest. Honest and intimate. If you're not, it's okay. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to pray for Randy. Those that are standing, I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to spend the time in prayer and then we're going to dismiss. Amen. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for a young man who will text a pastor and say, will you pray for me? Uh, Father, when I asked him, did he want to come forward or sit in the pew? He said, I don't know. So we called him up. And so, Father, I pray that you would be with him in this procedure. I pray that you'd be with his fears. I pray that you'd be with the surgeons, that you would give them wisdom and insight. 
And Father, I pray that through all of this, you would be glorified in what you're doing in this young man's life. I pray for his mom and dad, that you would give them the wisdom they need to raise him and instill in him the importance of following you. And we just ask this in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. And we pray that your will be done. Father, there's those that are standing and we do have a desire to be used of you and to be, Father, I hate to say a prayer warrior. I would say a prayer servant that would listen to our Heavenly Father and meet with you every day in prayer. Father, people like George Mueller and Luther Rice and John Piper, people that have been used of you in a mighty way have made prayer a priority. And so I pray that you would help us to plan on how to pray. I pray as a pastor, you teach me the best way to teach them and that you would help us to pray. Father, I am asking that this church would not progress any faster than we're praying. I pray the same for the school. Father, I pray that we would advance on our knees and stand back and see the hand of God work in a mighty way. But Father, if we're not praying, how can we be entrusted with greater things? So Father, help us to become a people of prayer, praying for our wives, our husbands, our children, our grandchildren, Father, praying for our nation, praying for the ministries of this church, and praying for revival to come. Father, I pray as we get ready to depart that those that are standing, that you would bless them with an extra measure of grace and help them figure out how you've wired them to pray to you. Help us to be honest and intimate. And Father, we're going to spend just a few minutes as a church family sitting and praying. And just help us to be your people.